This topic uh, will be presented by me, Liam Wyatt, my good friend and, and co-conspirator, Joseph Sinton. This is about uh, the advocacy campaign, the banner campaign, supporting copyright law reform in Australia in a way that was both, I believe, a, an improvement, a continuation of existing uh, best practices in our community for advocacy, and also some unique elements that I think are special, that we did a quite an interesting change, and I want to talk about that. So, Fair Use Advocacy in Australia, we ran this banner, well, this was the landing page. You click on the banner, you go there, in Australia for approximately four weeks, a few months ago, when visiting the English Wikipedia from within Australia, you would see a banner that takes you to this page. You may recognize the layout from the SOPA protests a few years ago. It's copyright that makes sense, that's fair. Wikipedians have a specific meaning of fair use. We use fair use for a very particular purpose, that is, for low resolution of images and sometimes short clips of sound files on Wikipedia articles to illustrate the subject of that article. That's important for English Wikipedia and many other Wikipedias don't do that for domestic legal reasons in that country, say in uh, France or in Germany, for example. Sweden, there isn't fair use and therefore the Swedish community have decided not to do that. That is not the meaning of fair use in law, there is much more options for that. Wikipedians do not like fair use many of the much of the time because we consider it to be a diminution, a devaluing of the importance of the public domain, like it is cheating, or we can just use a fair use image rather than really trying to get an uh, open license image instead. The people who oppose fair use in Australia, outside of the Wikipedia community, in the general public, in the copyright industry, oppose fair use because it is, for them, too much walking backwards from the power of exclusive copyright. So, when you hear, I don't like fair use in Wikipedians, it's the opposite reason to I don't like fair use in the general legal section. This campaign was important because, for me, this is the first time that Wikimedia has done any advocacy campaign, public policy, law, and banners that does not affect our content at all. In Freedom of Panorama advocacy, we have done in several countries. That will improve the amount of content available in comments about artwork in the country. SOPA or anti-blocking, uh, say the Turkey awareness campaigns, that's about access to the information itself, censorship, etc. If Wikipedia, if Australia had fair use legislation, that would not change anything about Wikipedia or Wikimedia projects because we already use it in the English Wikipedia, which is what is used in Australia. Australia does not have fair use. We have what is called fair dealing. That is the reverse process for copyright exceptions. Fair use, which we are familiar with, as a principle-based approach for copyright exception. Yes, it, a photograph, is in copyright, but because of these principles, I can use it in these circumstances without permission. So it's low resolution, it's very important to illustrate the topic, it's not undermining the commercial rights of the owner, Therefore, I can illustrate a Wikipedia article. For example, that's a principal approach. Fair dealing in use in Australia and some other countries, mainly Commonwealth countries, uh, is about specific exceptions. The Copyright Act says everything is restricted except these things. If your particular use or your particular technology does not get, is new, it's an innovation, it is by definition illegal until the, the government decides that is allowed. In 2006, a law was passed giving a new exception for the right to tape a video TV, a TV show onto videotape at home to watch tomorrow. Because that's a copy of a copyrighted thing, a television broadcast. 
everyone was doing it, but it was illegal until 2006. And the law says videotape. Therefore, VCR is okay and DVD or a hard drive is not okay until such time as there is a new law giving that exception. Forwarding an email or making a meme, these are technically illegal things. The fact that no one has ever sued anyone about those things is often given as a reason why it's not a problem. I say that's exactly why the law needs to change, because there's a law that no one is listening to. Right? Most people don't care. Sorry, the layout of that slide is a bit broken. Most people don't care about this nuance of law, and they just ignore it. You use a VCR tape until 2006 and no one noticed. But some organizations, like the school sector, have to care, or the government sector, because they are government-funded organizations. They have to follow the law. Therefore, <laughs> I think yellow. I think yellow. I'm not sure why we're not <laughs> quite so yellow, but you can still read it. Uh, therefore, the major reason why I got so copyrighteous about this issue in Australia is that the education sector, because we do not have, in fair dealing, an education use exception, free access content, freely available in the lieb, gratis, not lieb sense of free, is a remunerated copyright use of the school system. The school system in Australia pays approximately $18 million a year to the Copyright Collection Authority for the use of publicly available websites and often works. For example, Google Maps. Um, so the latest uh, copyright agency is the collecting authority that takes these royalties for legitimate normal things, you know, book publication performances in public spaces. That's all perfectly fine. Uh, if a school gives every a copy of a textbook to every student that's a royalty generating process, fine. I find it deeply offensive that a public school system is paying a privately run organization who takes a cut of a processing fee for content that was never supposed to be paid for in the first place. And then they keep that money because no one is asking for it and use it to create a fighting fund to lobby against the introduction of laws which would make that process uh, free in the first place. Uh, we have footnotes for this. Um, I find that utterly offensive as a, as, a, so, as a system of taking money for the public sector and then for them to claim that, a, that promoting fair use is for the benefit of big tech in Silicon Valley is, again, I find that deeply offensive because they're the ones taking the money from the schools to line their own organization's pockets. You have to make the bridal line. I find a copy of copy fraudulent. It is legal. It is deeply immoral. And that is why uh, the Australian Wikipedia community <coughs> agreed to this uh, banner campaign about a law, about an advocacy project that will have no impact on Wikipedia because we already use fair use. In fact, it was a public information campaign as, as far as the Australian community was concerned to say, look, this is what fair use means in practice. It's not scary. It's a Wikipedia article about your favorite band with the, the album cover. It's the, <coughs> these normal descriptions of Australian cultural heritage that is recent cultural heritage that we would not otherwise be able to show to you. The concept of fair use in Australia has been proposed six times over the last 20 years by government's own um, reports and inquiries, most recently by the Productivity Commission, which is about economics, by the Australian Law Reform Commission, which is about reforming the law, uh, and particularly about international treaties, when Australia signed an international treaty with the United States free trade agreement, we imported a lot of American 
uh, copyright restrictions, copyright extension, DMCA takedown process, but we did not take the matching flexibilities. So when our opponents say, oh, but we don't want to import an American copyright system, we already did import an American copyright system, just all the restrictive bits. Fair use is what makes the American copyright system work, balanced to, a re to some degree. So what we did was to support, this was important for a campaign, it was not out of nowhere, it was not just for fun, we were supporting the recommendations of the recent government inquiry that says, yes, we should have fair use, and some other things that were not about copyright. This was not, Wikipedia says fair use is good, sign up. It was, Wikipedia Australia recommends the government agree to this report. So there was a lot of existing academic research. It was not from nothing. It was based in, in lots of proper study. This was a promotion campaign. The plan was originally to put an image overlay on top of images when viewed in Australia that were fair use and say this, this is fair use, click to, to see it, you know, see what it means, what is this about, very contextual. We ran a consensus on the Australian Wikipedians notice board at English Wikipedia and they liked it. Then we discovered that technically that's a bit too difficult so we said okay well, we'll do in the spirit of the consensus, we will do a banner on articles that have fair use content in them, which is approximately 10-15% of all English Wikipedia articles. And then we discovered that we can't really do that for technical reasons, so okay, we will run a banner on all Wikipedia 10% of the time. And this was an interesting iteration process of bringing the Australian Wikipedia community to say yes we've got consensus for this but we can't actually do it so we will do this which follows the spirit of what we decided even if we cannot follow the letter and that was a really interesting process of making sure the consensus was followed and no one felt like we were cheating or lying um, constant communication this circular process was also important to use Wikipedia for advocacy purposes, you need, according to the policy, community consensus. The community's primary interest was, why are we making this vote if the Wikimedia Foundation hasn't even said if it's allowed? So I had to keep going backwards and forwards and shuttle diplomacy. Do you say it's okay if they say it's okay? Do you say it's okay if they say it's okay? And eventually we came to this consensus. So there was lots of talking, lots of back and forth. Once we then got to the commitment that everyone was happy, then we could work with the partner organizations a bit more behind the scenes because you can't really write a banner advocacy campaign as a crowdsource committee document. But we had the support of anyone who was around to say, yes, this was well advertised, it was highly visible in the relevant community. And we had, very surprisingly, almost no negative response to the concept of doing an advocacy campaign. We know that Wikipedia is neutral, um, but everyone said this is important, it fits our mission of free access to educational resources. We worked very closely with these Australian organisations, the Australian Digital Alliance, the Electronic Frontiers Australia, who ran all of the actual legal work in the country. Part of the deal was we, the community, or the chapter, who was also not involved, kept it arm's length because they did not want to be associated with political advocacy. That's fine. Uh, they said, we're already doing a campaign in this field. We have the lawyers, we're talking to the politicians. But we don't know how to get any public awareness for this topic. That's what we can do. That's what Wikimedia can do. What Wikimedia cannot do, at least in Australia, was meet the politicians and actually have the legal arguments. So this campaign was very much building on the base of existing advocacy organizations who are our longtime friends and existing academic and government research, not out of nothing because we think it's a good idea one day. The community response, I will I'll hand over to Seddon about the practice of this campaign very quickly. The community response was very important 
that the banners should be about facts, not about fair use is amazing, do it. But did you know that fair use doesn't exist in Australia, but you use it every day? Much more um, factual in the, in the approach on Wiki, and then you click on it, and it takes you to something that can be more advocative uh, and less uh, main space Wikipedia neutrality. But the banners needed to be more factual. That was a piece of feedback. The second piece of feedback was, we need to have a normal Wikipedia article just with footnotes and neutrality and all these normal policies discussing the history of fair use proposals in Australia. We can't advocate for something if acknowledging we're being you know, political if we don't have the usual stuff as well. So we wrote that up. And then were the main pieces of community feedback which we responded to. So banner clicked the meta page, which was that black one that I showed you before, which clicked to the campaign site which we built, which the Australian Front um, at Australian Electronic Frontiers Australia and the Australian Digital Alliance built, which lets you click to sign to your send an email to your politician, your local politician, and your 12 state senators, so 13 emails per person. We had 10,000 people do that, which is an extraordinarily high number for a very obscure piece of copyright law. Uh, and so that is 10,000 people times 13 emails each. So we really brought some visibility to this campaign where our opponents have a $15 million bank balance for opposing this campaign. They did not have the visibility. We did not have the money, and we kind of much more success. In a second phase of banners, which Sam will describe, we managed also, in a way that is appropriate for our own terms of use, allow the public to go straight from banner to the campaign website, which greatly, as you know, every time you click, you lose people. That greatly increased the efficiency of signups by removing the intermediate steps. But we did it in a way that was still appropriate to the terms of use of Wikimedia linking to a third party website. So <clears throat> you're probably going to see an unusual number of graphs for a legal advocacy talk. Um, I do apologize for my voice, but uh, karaoke has left some deleterious <laughs> effects on my voice, so I have been to tea. So, <clears throat> Um, we use central notice for this campaign. Um, we're not the first campaign to use central notice. The Freedom of Panorama campaign in Europe about three years ago used central notice. Central notice is the banner system. You may see it in fundraising for fundraising banners. You might have seen it uh, banners about the recent strategy. This system is probably one of the most powerful non-profit communication tools on the planet. It allows us to tap into our readership of around 500 to 600 million people with 19 billion page views. So going through this campaign, the aim was always to try and, and honor the original agreement of running <coughs> around 10 to 15% of Wikipedia articles. So the way in which we did this was originally we launched at 50%, the campaign ran for two days at that, we dropped down to 25%, and then after the first week, we then settled down into a 12 to 15 percent number of page views. And what you'll see on the bottom graph, which is the number of visits to the sign-up website, and you'll see that for the most part, it's fairly stable. And the reason why this was fairly stable was that we used something called A-B testing. Now, what is A-B testing? Simply enough, you take your population, you split them in two, and you present them with two different options. Now, unfortunately, with the yellow screen, they look almost identical, but there, are, there is a difference, which is the color of the button, and there's a, uh, a further identifier on the button to say, go further on. And basically, you run these two against each other, and one will generate more actions compared with the other. It's uh, the basics of most web design in terms of how you improve the experience for your customers, if you're someone like Amazon, it's how you make more money. If you're someone like Wikimedia, it's how you make more money. But also, <laughs> it means that it's, you get more people to commit to your call to action. And so we did this in this campaign. 
In this instance, we used two banners that had two very different types of message. One was more emotive, whereby you kind of appeal into the person's emotions. And the second one, which is more factual, really going to the, the basis of why the lack of fair use in Australia is, is not good. And so basically what you do is you split your traffic in this instance four ways. This is a 24-hour uh, period during the campaign. And basically you put them against each other. It's a bit like a royal rumble. So you'll have maybe two or four banners going at each other and basically you wait until you can identify which one is the winner. So as you can see on day one and day two, we started, we had four banners. Two of them were not performing. They were performing much less compared to the other two. So we drop those out and we let the other two fight it out. And eventually you have a single winner, which is the most effective banner. What this means is, is that comparatively speaking, you might have a banner in this instance, which was being 33% more, 33 more effective than another wording. So if you only used your single wording, you could be, that's 33 less e percent emails, that's 33% less people engaged in your campaign. And that was on mobile, and it's on desktop. So in this instance, we pitted them all against each other. And what we found was, is actually there was two messages of equal power. So because you know, nobody likes to see the same thing again and again and again, present the two to your audience, keep them engaged, give them different messages. And that's what we did. So we ran this. And uh, if you just kind of, uh, you'll see that our traffic uh, varies across the 24 hour period. And by the way, there is a meta reference to an unlabeled access if you're playing Wikimania Bingo. Um, and what we have here is so we have desktop, which is the big spikes, and then we have mobile. And what you'll see is our users during the day are much more active on desktops, they're at work, they're at school, at university. And basically, as people get more distracted, they start to move onto their phones throughout the day until they're at home on their sofas and they will be using their mobile phones. And that becomes the one of the primary engagement methods, which is why we do different testing for mobile and different testing for desktop, because they are two different audiences. And what you'll see actually, uh, banner one was the winner on mobile, and banners two and three, which I'm not presented here, but they were different types of messaging, and you'll, and you'll find that on mobile and desktop in very different use cases very different audiences. Um, what I want to do though is, so I want to focus in on just one particular area about why we do A-B testing in something like a legal advocacy camp campaign. So what we did is you saw some of the earlier banners. We created a new style of banner. This is actually a very old fundraising banner style from about four or five years ago where you have the banner at the top and you click on it and you get a drop down. And so what this does is it reduces the number of steps. We spoke about that earlier. And what you can see here is we actually reduced the traffic from 15 to 25%. And when we switched on the new banner, we managed to match that, that growing upward trend that you see in the orange. So it was going up and we switched it to 25%. And the following day, we activated the new banner and we managed to maintain the same amount of traffic with half the number of people. So this is to the, the, uh, the sign-up website. So we're being more efficient in terms of how we're using our platform. And, and efficiency is key. Banner blindness is a problem that we, we really suffer from. And you keep doing this, you keep iterating, and you get more efficient and you keep staving off this decline in engagement over time as more and more people are signing up. Yeah. Uh, so we had a lot of work in, in making the banner campaign more efficient. Over the course of a five week period, we ran this campaign because we came from nowhere from the perspective of the copyright industry in Australia. They took uh, about five weeks to create their response. Uh, and this came in the form of a counter hashtag. We were a fair copyright O's. Uh, and they used their uh, their marketing budget and their mailing lists of 
everyone who receives royalties for music and books in the country, which is a lot of people, uh, to create a campaign called Free Is Not Fair, which also had the, um, the logical floor of implying that all of the existing exceptions in fair dealing, like satire or using a VCR, are also not fair. Any free use is not fair uh, in their argument. But uh, that had quite a lot of visibility through their ability to talk to the existing members of their network that had very limited effect beyond the existing people who were already signed up to that community of, of uh, copyright rights um, royalty reci recipients in Australia. We had a variety of uh, online newspaper articles written by journalists who were also board members of the copyright associations, uh, which we tried to decide whether we would respond to directly or whether that would uh, simply give them more visibility um, due to the massive number of logical fallacies and ad hominem and straw arguments within those, straw man arguments within those uh, responses. We, in general, because Wikipedia and Wikipedians are seen in a good light in Australia, a good reputation for not being an advocacy organization, not being political, meant that they had quite a lot of difficulty responding to a grassroots campaign because their argument is we represent Australian artists, we represent Australian culture. So they don't want to look like they're they are big business, which they are. So their argument was that Wikipedia is big tech uh, and that either we are paid by Google directly or we are somehow unwillingly a stooge of Google uh, in some way, shape or form. So all of the response to our campaign used phrases like big tech, or Silicon Valley, or uh, American corporate interests coming to steal our local little artists' content, completely ignoring that the American cultural industry is doing very well under this legal system. Uh, so it would actually be to our benefit, not to our detriment. Um, it, it was also very um, stressful for the Australian, for the Australian uh, chapter and for individuals involved in the campaign to have industry and its PR machine calling us up and saying, so how much does Google pay you? How much does Google pay you? How, how much does Google pay you? Um, so that if we ignored them, they say, Wikipedians refuse to answer the question. And if we answer the question, they would say, Wikipedia said that Google doesn't pay them anything. Do you believe it? Or something like that. So there were, these were leading questions trying to sow doubt into the community's mind about what are our motives. Um, the fact that we're volunteers and the board members of the, 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 the CEO and so forth of the copyright agencies are all ex-news corporation executives. For them to be arguing that we are the corporate giant is a little ironic. The three results from this campaign are legislation. We don't know yet. We're waiting for the government to make its official response to the recommendations of the Productivity Commission. We will find out once the government makes its response to those recommendations, then we will see what the main opposition legal party says. They will probably say the opposite of whatever the government says, just because they are the opposition. And then there will be a process of legislation and so forth. So this is round this is round six in the last twenty years of this of this issue, and it is not a, a short, it's not like this is going to be a fixed tomorrow or change tomorrow, it's a long process. Um, we have a lot more people now aware of this, of this topic. A lot of the comments both in Wikipedia uh, and on Reddit and on comments to the newspapers and so forth said, I thought we already had fair use because they're used to working in YouTube or on Wikipedia or so forth. So there's a lot of awareness raising. And the Wikimedia internal benefits or changes are what Sam has been talking about in terms of using our infrastructure in new ways. There's a lot of press, I will, I'll uh, move through this quickly. This is all of the talk page on Meta of Fair Copyright Odds, all of these references, all of these screenshots. 
in a lot of mainstream press, we had a major article uh, by uh, the economics editor, which is important, not culture editor, not, you know, this is, this is an economics issue, this is not arts or digital, this is about the economy. Uh, on the third page of the Sydney, New Canberra, Melbourne newspaper, this was mainstream news. Um, we did Reddit AMA um, interviews with uh, hundreds of questions and thousands, on thousand upvotes. So we talked to different communities. We had lots of supporting affiliate organizations domestically and internationally uh, getting involved. Jimmy happened to come to Australia, so he talked about it at a, at a business conference he went to. Choice Australia, which is the Australian equivalent of uh, the um, Consumer Reports. They ran this, this campaign the last time there was a government inquiry. So they sent to their mailing list, hey, look, the, the, the new one on the same topic, sign up again. Uh, Linux Australia, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a lot of, uh, and Catherine did some fact checking on the free is not fair argument. So we had a lot of visibility, we had a lot of interest. Uh, we'll see where it goes in legislation. It's a little bit disheartening that there's no conclusion yet. I, don't have an answer, maybe we'll be like, we changed the law in a big way, or maybe nothing happens for the next six years. Maybe we'll be back here again at the next government inquiry. But I think we gave it a bloody good go. Thank you. Well, let, let's switch to the next session. We are like, so, right. While Dimi comes up here, do you want to uh, have a question? Yeah, it's a it's a yeah question comment. Um, firstly, we uh, we ran a very similar banner campaign. We being Wikimedia South Wikimedia Africa. Wikimedia South Africa. Sorry, yes, we being Wikimedia South Africa and support of Freedom Panorama. We're trying to get the law <coughs> change, um, which said and um, assisted us with. Thank you, said it. Uh, the, your, your comments on um, the pro-copyright guys asking, does Google pay you? It was very interesting when I was sitting in the parliamentary no, scenes. How, how much does Google pay you? Do they pay you? How much does Google pay you? It's, pay you? it's sort of an assuming question. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It was very interesting when I was sitting in the parliamentary proceedings in South Africa. They were asking exactly the same question. Yeah. Literally the same. The exact same question. Yeah. Google so, is the big enemy. And maybe the RNA. So it does. Um, I have to be on the Australian committee, yeah. and I mean, I ask you, do I look like a Google conspiracy? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, my, so that's my our, right. our other Australian in the room from the Australian chapter committee can attest to the harassment. Yeah. Uh, so, um, do I look like a Google conspiracy? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you do. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> that is not a problem to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like writing to Google Australia saying, well, if I am your employee, can you pay me now? That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to be getting the paychecks. Yeah, the copyrighted yeah, yeah, copyright yeah, copyright 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 anyway. But it's interesting because the correspondent, who was the main person who was working on that, he did a whole series of email queries, and that's what he started with was Google conspiracy, and he never gave up, even when both the foundation and the Australian chapter said, "Look, hey, you're just barking up the wrong tree. This guy still believes that we're a Google conspiracy." Thank you. To the effect of uh, the Australian Digital Alliance uh, partner organisation, their office is in the National Library of Australia building, so they were writing to the, the board members of the National Library saying, do you know that a Google affiliate organisation is in your building? But it's, it's true, it's interesting, there's, there's clearly this sort of consistent narrative, you know, whether it be in Australia or South Africa, of um, the copyright forces and peddling Google this. already has fair use in America. But, 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 they, they already do it. This won't affect them anyway. But, but, but that was only one component of it. I mean, it, it was the exact same narrative with um, it's the Americans coming along trying to impose our law on us. It's American imperialism. It's a sort of um, somewhat nativistic argument, it's a xenophobic argument. So, by the way, um, also in, in Europe, I spent a um, considerable amount of my time mopping up after industry lobbyists who just go around and say Wikipedia is a Google sub puppet, and you know they're being always shown first on the on the 
search results, so that means you know that's illegal economic output. You know um, they receive in kind, and if you say we don't really get that much money from Google, then you know they whip up um, Wikimedia sponsorship pages and um, you know old news about grants and money we receive from Google. So it's um, it's quite uh, hurtful. Um, so maybe that's um, well not a great introduction, but yeah, I'll, I'll start from the beginning. Um, I'm Dini, I work in Brussels uh, with the European Wikimedia chapters, user groups and communities, where currently our main, 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 main focus is um, to make sure that the ongoing uh, copyright reform in the European Union is as beneficial to free knowledge as possible and <coughs> as harmless to the free and open internet as is, um, is possible. Um, so what happened is, last September, after several years of deliberations, consultations, dialogues, the European Commission uh, proposed a legislative package, and part of this package was a, a directive called um, Copyright in the Digital Single Market. Um, the idea behind this um, directive was that the current copyright framework in Europe has been written in, has been adopted in 2001, and has been originally drafted, in, if I'm not mistaken, back in the first draft is from 1998, so in a time, it has been written at a time before Facebook, before Twitter, and maybe more importantly, before YouTube, and before Deezer, and before Spotify. So we were, we were in bad need of an update, of an overhaul of the copyright rules in Europe, and the Commission acknowledges this. Um, so um, they actually also acknowledge that um, we do have a single market in the European Union, and we do have one internet in the European Union, but uh, copyright is territorial, which means we have such fragmented rules about what is or isn't allowed in every single country. These are the 13 copyright exceptions as implemented by the member states, you know, as uh, shown in a, in, a, in a table. And you can see that the implementations are so so different, partially, and even in between the green bottles, which here are yellow, of course, uh, there are huge differences in between the implementation. Another thing um, that uh, pushed the Commission to propose um, an overhaul of, European, of the European copyright framework was that, um, well, removing roaming fees across the EU proved to be hugely popular with, um, with the population, and the EU really needs to be popular right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, they were thinking, well, maybe if we let people uh, watch their favorite TV series while in another EU member state, that will make us uh, similarly um, Similarly, very, very, very popular. Um, so they were coming, the commission services were coming from a very, very good place. They, they had a very sensible <coughs> logic behind what they were proposing. Unfortunately, by the time that um, the entire drafts and proposals had passed all the political decision making loops and had come out of all the political cabinets of commissioners in the European Commission, um, what we got was not only horribly unambitious but partially dangerous to the internet. Um, we received a, a proposal for a, an exception for text and data mining, um, which is something we thought we were always um, legally allowed to do. So if you have access to a document, you can use um, tools to search through the document. You can hit Control F and search through a PDF to see how many times the word I, the letter I appears in that document. So now the commission wanted to still, you know, um, create a little bit of more legal certainty. So they said, well, text and data mining shall be legal for research organizations. The problem is, if they say it's legal for research organizations, it doesn't really imply that it's illegal to do without an extra permission for, for, for everybody else. Um, they proposed a content filtering provision, which um, basically means that any online platform, any website that uh, hosts large amounts of user-generated content would have to install content recognition technologies that automatically take down um, copyright infringing content. They, they're proposing an ancillary copyright, a press publisher's right provision that um, horribly failed in member states like Germany, Spain, and even in Belgium. Belgium. Uh, but, you know, um, the, it, at least in these countries, didn't hurt Wikipedia. The version we currently have uh, proposed by the European Commission um, would also make it very, very hard um, to have an annotated bibliography on Wikipedia because it would require us to get an extra license from press publishers in order to include news articles in annotated bibliographies, which is just, well, for puppy, the word idiot that comes to mind. Um, we have an educational exception proposal which, while very noble and very good and very useful, 
um, doesn't account for the fact that education nowadays doesn't take place only in schools and at universities. Education takes place in the park, um, in the train, or even at the conference in a hotel. So you know, limiting an educational exception to you know to the place where where, where it's happening is is doesn't make much sense. And they proposed a, a an additional exception for the preservation of cultural heritage, something that is great that we really need, but. Um, the preservation exception goes as far as to just say that um, museums and archives are allowed to digitize the works that are in their possession, which um, doesn't strike me as, as very, very um, progressive. Um, so, um, as you know, the Commission doesn't decide on its own. This is um, my own rendition of the legislative process in the EU. Many people are complaining that it's way too complicated and they don't understand it. So here is an 8-bit version of it. Um, the Commission proposes, and then the European Parliament and the Council. The Council is where uh, the member states' governments meet, so it's like a crappy Senate or a crappy, or a crappy upper chamber. Um, and once they agree on a text, then it actually becomes legislation. So we're now in the, in the stage where the um, European Parliament, uh, in its various committees and um, in its uh, well, various bodies, is discussing um, the copyright exception, and a few things got introduced into the conversation. Um, for once, um, in, the, in a lot of committees and by a lot of members of the European Parliament, um, decided that the preservation exception needs to go further and um, needs to include something that we call a public domain safeguard. It needs to include something that says that once a work is in the public domain, if you make a copy of it, the copy is also in the public domain, does not get new rights on it. Um, we're talking in, in across several committees about freedom of panorama, we um, actually received from a few opinion-giving committees something that's called the user-generated content exception, which we never thought is even possible. Um, but, uh, well, I mean, user-generated content, it means everything or nothing. It's basically a knockoff version of fair use for Europe, because in Europe we cannot have fair use because that's an American concept. And, you know, we're at this point where we don't want to import American <laughs> concepts, uh, mainly because of the French government, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, under <coughs> the content exception that actually um, seems to be passing, and uh, while well, we're dealing with something that is um, unwaivable rights for performance, but I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, right now what is um, important to keep in mind, it's a very messy process, so we have five responsible committees, four of them are opinion-giving committees, and one of them, the Legal Affairs Committee, is the lead committee that actually makes the final decision. Now, the opinion-giving committees already um, made their decisions, so, you know, voted on their opinions, and um, the good news is that the most powerful one, the Internal Market Committee, um, which also is responsible for consumer protection and is associated with the Legal Affairs Committee, um, did a very, very positive um, opinion. They uh, adopted a full freedom of panorama for all users across all member states. Um, they adopted the safeguard the public domain provision that we were asking for, they largely fixed the upload filtering content recognition technologies provision and they included a full user-generated content exception for commercial and non-commercial users. So, um, extremely progressive from an European perspective. Unfortunately, they didn't fix text and data mining and ancillary copyright. And another unfortunate thing is that um, this first success woke up um, the collecting societies um, the industries and uh, the French government representatives in Brussels. So they put massive pressure on the next uh, opinion-giving committees. Um, and the pressure was so big that in the culture committee, we had a freedom of panorama compromise filed by, the French, by a French conservative member of the European Parliament and already approved and supported by all other parliamentary groups. And just a few days before the vote, he actually withdrew his own compromise, something that, well, I have never seen in, 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 in past years happening in Brussels, that somebody withdraws their own compromise that is already supported by whole political groups. This is how big the pressure was on, on him. Um, so yeah, the Culture Committee votes and the Industry Research and Energy Committee votes um, didn't go very well. And the Civil, Civil Liberties Committee, well, they said, look, um, we cannot focus on everything because nobody will take us seriously. Let's just focus on this upload filtering content recognition technology thing because um, this is very closely reviewed related to civil liberties. Um, and they're doing this, and they're doing a good job on that. So um, this is where we are. But the problem that we're having is of, course that, is, of course, that these are too many topics for us to effectively work on. These are too many things, although all of them are important for us to, to be a leading voice in. 
So we had a um, big fat Brussels meeting in, what well, is the name would suggest, in Brussels this year, um, which is the annual meetup of uh, European Wikimedians who care about uh, public policy and um, advocacy activities. And we discussed really, really a lot which ones should be the ones that we really, really push for. Um, so it wasn't an easy process. We um, spent two days. Um, we did other things as well, but you know this was a very big focus of the whole meeting. Um, and in the end, we decided, of course, freedom of panorama would be something that is among our priorities because it's our topic. If we don't speak up for it, nobody will, and it would have direct effect on our projects. Um, plus, we have examples. We have the Wunderwasser House in Wien that. Um, depending on how the picture is taken, you can use them either from Germany or from Austria, although both have freedom of panorama. We have a German book uh, that has uh, an image of a Polish graffiti that was stopped from being published in France because of the freedom of panorama. Yeah. And so we can explain very much the failures of the internal market, of the single market in Europe, because of the lack of these provisions. Um, the other thing we decided to really focus on is the safeguarding the public domain. Not only because positively defining the public domain in European Right, legislation would be a game changer, a narrative changer in our mind, but also because we are actually having ongoing real problems with it. We're being sued in Germany over this portrait by, um, of Richard Wagner, and we are have, being asked by the Museo <coughs> in Madrid to take down images from comments of 17th century and a Flemish impressionist that they claim copyright on. Um, and, um, well, upload filtering and content recognition technologies, of course, these are important to us because although we can very well sympathize with authors who feel like they're getting the short end of the stick and they need the stronger um, negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis larger internet platforms, we have to admit that technology is nowhere near good enough to, to really balance you know, what could be you know, um, a good negotiating position for authors against um, basic uh, rights and liberties that we have. Uh, currently, the technology is so bad, I mean, dumb is not in the stretch here, it doesn't recognize copyright exceptions, it doesn't recognize fair use provisions, it doesn't recognize all these things. So, you know, these are the three things that we decided to work on. <coughs> and um, what will happen next, um, the lead committee is the Committee on Legal Affairs in the European Parliament. And um, these are the rapporteurs, so these are the representatives of each political group that um, are in this committee. And they will start meeting in September. And in September, during their meetings, they'll try to um, reach compromise agreements. Now, um, the good news is, on quite a few of those issues, we managed to get quite a few of these groups um, to support us. Um, the bad news is that this is still probably not enough. How do we know that these people support us? Well, we talked to them, they told us, but more importantly so, they actually went a step further people who support us actually filed amendments um, that we asked them to file and that we wrote for them. Um, so, you know, their, their support is quite public and, you know, they cannot just take a step back. And um, <coughs> just to open a bracket here, if you happen to write um, amendments for uh, political offices and uh, for a few of them, um, make sure that every time um, sort of a staff member or an MEP approaches you and asks you to write an amendment for them, um, that you uh, give them uh, at least slightly different versions of the text. Because um, they would look really ridiculous if they came to the negotiating table and they all had, like five of them had the exact same text. It would look like they copied from each other. They would look stupid and they don't like looking stupid. But uh, what's also important is for you to have a big file and keep track of which version you gave to whom because otherwise you know, it can get quite messy. But yeah, I mean, as well, this is the Freedom of Panorama example. We wrote all of these, of course, and you know, you can see that um, you know, it's, it's always slightly different and you know, slightly different in the structure. Um, so this is what's going to happen now. They will discuss, they'll try to reach compromise. If they reach a compromise, compromise have a very good track record of being adopted by large majorities and committees. Um, if they don't reach a compromise, what will happen is it will have a, um, what you call in English, a vote. You vote on, the, on each amendment until an amendment gets a majority. Um, in English, they call it a crucial vote, but I feel like the, the term crucial vote doesn't really explain, you know, the intensity behind it. So I really like using the German word Kampfabstimmung. Um, so a, there will be a Kampfabstimmung, which is currently scheduled for the 10th of October. So on the 10th of October, we need to get a majority on our issues if we don't have a compromise um, amendment, compromise amendment on them by then. The good news is, I do think it's, it's um, 
possible, it's likely to get a majority, um, at least um, on upload filtering and on safeguarding the public domain. Freedom of Panorama seems a bit of a toss-up. And for Freedom of Panorama to get a majority, well, I try to crunch the numbers. It looks like we need to convince um, three more people. Um, and of course, you know, to keep everybody in line that is on our line right now, because the other side is not sleeping. And um, from all the members of the, of the uh, Legal Affairs Committee, these seem to be the swing bulls. So these are the people um, who are likely to be convinced. So out of these 12 people, we need to convince three. I'm already working with um, many of you on, on some of these people. Uh, you'll realize I have some socialists here. Um, this is because, well, although the socialist group officially, you know, supports freedom of panorama and safeguard the public domain, they have a very terrible track record at voting in a unified manner. So they're usually very, very split. So we must make sure, you know, that, um, you know, they, they vote in line. And here from um, the conservative group, as you can see, um, well, in, in, central and, in the central and eastern European member states, especially you have Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, there seems to be... <laughs> People seem to be slightly annoyed by the German conservatives who pushing ancillary copyright that much, so they are quite willing on one or two issues to not vote in line with them, and I, I really hope we can make use of that. Um, and uh, one thing that could be interesting, but that I failed um, to um, reach is we need people in Portugal, and we have almost nobody in Portugal. What's happening with Media Portugal. So please, if somebody, if you know somebody in Portugal who speaks Portuguese, who can spare, I don't know, a few hours over the next month, please let me know because I need somebody who speaks Portuguese. Um, so um, in parallel, this whole process is of course also happening in the European Council where the member states meet. Um, there we are at the stage of um, basically um, amendment or like compromise proposals by the presidency. Um, they will be discussed at the beginning of October. We were a bit lucky because the Austrian Ministry of Justice uh, shared the internal documents with us and asked us for comments. And uh, we might now um, use this to also contact the ministries in other countries to tell them in our comments on the preliminary drafts of the European Council. Um, what uh, we already did is at the beginning of the process, so from beginning from September until this February more or less, um, we did um, send a letter or have a meeting with the national ministries in 20 European member states countries. And that wasn't me, that was local communities and local chapters and local user groups who did this. So a big thanks to that. And um, well, 20 out of 28 member states is quite a good coverage. I mean, it's um, respect. So, you know, if we manage to follow up on that, I believe that will be effective over, um, over the long term. So, um, yeah, not to forget one more thing. Uh, I told you about these unwaivable rights for performers. So what is happening here, uh, maybe you have um, not missed uh, a very, very apocalyptically written blog post by the EFF. The EFF tends to be a bit apocalyptic about things. Um, so um, in the European Parliament, the performers, so the music performers, the ones who go to the studio and, you know, with their guitar and are given the notes and record the song, um, they're complaining, their collecting societies, their organiz umbrella organizations are complaining that, well, they um, don't have a good position. Uh, whenever if a song goes on and becomes really, really famous and makes a lot of money, they just get a few hundred euros that they were given, given uh, to and, you know, handed over all their rights. So what their collecting society wants to do is they want to create a unwaivable right, so, you know, a right that they cannot sign away, a, a, a piece of a right to each recording that will always stay with them. And while, you know, maybe that's, from my personal perspective, it's not the best idea to do, you know, in, in an already very complicated IP system, um, how the collecting societies of the music industry fight among each other is not really our, how can I say, a Dutch person once told me this is not our hill to die on. Um, so maybe, maybe not, but the problem you're having with this is that if there is an unwaivable right, it means you cannot waive away your rights even for free licenses, which would be a big, big problem for us because we work a lot with free licenses. So what we did is we decided, well, let's not write a, a very apocalyptic blog post. Instead, um, we met with, um, uh, with the collecting society, with the umbrella organ European umbrella organization of um, the music performers, and we had a talk with them, and we told them about our problem, and they actually agreed. They said, no, we don't want to hurt free licenses. Um, so we um, came to a compromise. We said, look, I mean, we, we won't take a position in that, but we need um, to have this in. We need to have um, 
in, in German copyright law, they have this, they call this a Linux clause, so, you know, an exception for free licenses from an unwaivable right. So, you know, a right is unwa unwaivable un unless you give a proper free license to it. Um, so they agreed to it. They actually included it in their own proposal. And it has been a compromise in the culture committee, and it has been adopted by the culture committee. And now it is most likely that if such a performance right passes, it will include this, which is something we kind of did on the side together with Creative Commons, of course, we worked a lot with Creative Commons on this, but we decided to be very, very silent about it because um, there was no need for it to raise another issue and to make it very, 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 very public. So, um, just as, as a side note, currently the uh, Council of the European Union is working on a decision on open data and reuse of council documents, which, if done well, will mean that all council documents and images and so on and so forth will be compatible with CC BY. Um, there is a, a little bit of a um, problem right now because they basically have something that says you're not allowed to use these, um, you're not allowed to, to change the original meaning of the document, which uh, would make it incompatible with our free, well, for commons and for uh, the free licenses we use. Um, so we are now asking the um, member states in the council uh, the Netherlands and Austria have already agreed to, you know, to propose to remove this part so it's properly compatible with CC BY. So this is something that's happening on the site. I just want to give it to you as an FYI. But it could be a very big thing because if they make this decision, then it would open up the entire European Council documents for uh, Commons and for Wikipedia. So um, the one thing I wanted to keep in mind, 10th October, very important vote. In September, we need to be very active in, in swinging MEPs in the Legal Affairs Committee. And I will be annoying many of you who are in this room about helping me with this. And uh, with this, I thank you and uh, welcome to your day. We only have two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four questions. All right. Uh, we start with. Hello, I'm Zico. Just a short note in general about fair use. We tend to say that in the US you can have fair use constructions and in Germany you cannot. And there was once a German lawyer who explained to us, well, these differences, they are not that fundamental. It's not very complicated. So in Germany, for example, you could have much more fair use things, but uh, German Wikipedia somehow decided against to make it simply uh, and have the gray zone. But it's very complicated. I really much appreciate what you do and try to see that well, we can push a big ship of European Union a little bit more to our direction. Kind of great things. So that's true. We have some notions of fair use in many European uh, jurisdictions. It's just not, um, it doesn't say it directly. And yeah, also, Bulgarian Wikipedia is very conservative in that regard. Who wanted to? Uh, you? Uh, so, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so, I wanted to say that I'm actually Portuguese. And I will be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I actually also had a question because I actually live in France right now. And my question is why do you think France is so against this? Uh, welcome. <coughs> there is so yeah, so generally in, in France you have this much longer tradition about investing a lot more public funds into um, culture and about seeing culture as something extremely important in, in France. Like in most countries, you know how there are some things like um, national security, terrorism, and then you know when something about this is going to pass, it's not even being properly discussed, it's just being fast tracked through parliament and through the decision making process. In France, cultural issues are like national security issues. They just have this, this level of importance in the political process. Um, and um, another thing is, so how, what is important to understand is continental European politicians, continental European decision makers are extremely proud of, of their national cultures. They're extremely proud that they have a long history of, let's say, a national opera. They have a long history of a theater, they have a long history of, of, of literature and, and book publishing, and that's something good. And there are quite a few good things about continental European um, copyright. At the same time, what we're seeing now is that, from their perspective, the internet is making a ton of money 
And out of every euro that's being turned around through European cultural content on the internet, a percentage goes to, well, big US companies. And they, from their perspective, this is not fair. You know, the shares are not fairly distributed. Not enough money stays within the European cultural sector, and too much money goes into the American tech sector. Now, you may agree or disagree with that, but this is their perspective, and it's important to understand that. And um, therefore, you know, our position cannot be just, no, we are against this. Our position needs to be yes. But if you want to, like, shift the powers, shift it towards the author, not towards collecting societies or big industry players, that, you know, wouldn't really help the cultural sector. So, you know, this is a bit of thinking that goes with it. One more? If not, I will release you. <laughs> I like how the emoji is inside the cheek. That's pretty good. How did that even happen? I guess it's small enough to fit into this. Yeah, I guess. That makes it just more perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's a shock. I guess we can go that. But we can't just do that. Yeah. The perfect one to go is inside. Perfect. There's also... <laughs> like the, the net neutrality comments on this. Yeah. As someone who really doesn't really support comments and questions. Test. Hi everyone, uh, since we are a little over time, I'm going to go ahead and launch in. Uh, so I am Jake Rogers, I'm one of the uh, attorneys from the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, I'm going to be primarily going through this uh, Community Health Legal Defense. Uh, assisting me, we have uh, Patrick Early, one of the uh, members of the support team from the Wikimedia Foundation, who I think will help uh, answer some questions about uh, community issues and uh, provide some non-legal perspective if people are looking for that. Um, I also have Percy with me, who is the legal team mascot at the Wikimedia Foundation. So following on from Dimmy, this is going to be a presentation not about what we want the law to be, but uh, about what the law is, which is both how it can be helpful and how, unfortunately, it is currently very unhelpful uh, in a lot of ways. So let me talk first about a new program that the Foundation has put up that may, many of you may not have seen. Uh, we have put up a program called the Community Health Legal Defense Program. Uh, this is a program, and you can find it on Foundation Wiki, uh, to help community members uh, when legal tools are necessary to protect them from harassment, doxing, or other unavoidable conduct on or off Wiki. Uh, similarly to existing programs, which we already have, 
So we have a defensive contributors program, which helps find legal counsel and pay for that counsel uh, when people are sued based on the content they write. Uh, and we also have a legal fees assistance program that does the same thing when people are sued for their functionary work or other administrative work on the projects. Both these programs are limited. We can't always help, uh, both due to funding and the fact that not every case is appropriate, but we try. And this program is an expansion there which uh, is hoping to be able to help people who are uh, in an environment online where people are trying to cause them harm and other tools aren't up to the task of stopping that harm. What this means is that one might be able to uh, find a lawyer and then bring a legal action against a person who is causing harassment. Uh, and there's a number of different ways to do that, and I'll talk a little bit about them, but the general idea is that the fact that you are not able to uh, pay for your own lawyer shouldn't be uh, something that stops you from protecting yourself from harassment just because you've been working on women projects. Now, unfortunately, there are some limitations on this. Um, time and foundation funding are both major ones. Uh, that is, doing one of these kind of cases can take a long time and uh, can cost a fair amount of money. And as with these other programs, foundation funding is limited. Uh, ability to make a difference is limited, and I'll be talking about that in a little more detail as we go into this, but uh, not every case is workable within the legal system, and uh, it's not a good use of anybody's time or money to do a legal case that won't actually change anything. Uh, and then difficulty in the process is a limitation. Uh, you have to be, in order to bring a legal case to help stop harassment, you have to be willing to go through uh, a fair amount of legal process that can be sometimes a little bit tough to go through. So let me start by giving uh, a couple of examples of cases that might make sense for this kind of thing, and then get into some of the details. So one type of case that might make sense is a user that is threatened by a technically skilled harasser. Uh, the reason that the legal process can help here is that if somebody is very technically skilled, they might be able to bypass tools like community blocking efforts, even foundation blocking efforts, uh, or get things up on other sites, make new sock puppets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that make it difficult to actually stop them from doing what they're doing without getting some outside force uh, assisting. And that outside force can be a legal proceeding. Um, a second related point is when community solutions don't work. So for example, if a harasser is doxing someone off the key where the community can't help, um, I'll do questions at the end. What is doxing? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. sorry. Um, so doxing is a, I guess, colloquial term for uh, when someone publishes private information that they're not supposed to have access to and that is then causing harm on an individual. Uh, a, a example of this might be uh, somebody who gets your work email uh, of, a, of a volunteer who is otherwise being synonymous and then tries to tell people <coughs> to email their, them at work and, and harass them or uh, say someone's home address uh, with the intent of like bothering them at home uh, or you know ordering a hundred pizzas to their home address or something of that nature. And lastly, a situation where legal tools will work. Uh, so if the so you need a situation where community processes are not working or someone is very technically skilled and legal tools will work to solve that problem. Uh, again, an example of this might be somebody who is located in the same country as the person being harassed, uh, because that usually means the courts will be able to actually do something about the problem. Um, or somebody that has uh, some amount of money, or is otherwise the person harassing has themselves some standing, so that there is something that the legal system and the courts can then uh, use to make sure that that person will actually change their behavior. And we have the time and ability to help, which, as I've been mentioning, is one of the problems. All right. And then also when the problem is serious and the user is dedicated to fighting a long legal battle. And I'm going to use this one to launch into some of the details about the legal process that I've been talking about. So to do a legal case against a person requires that you file a complaint where you explain what the problem is. Then you put together evidence and go to court. And then there has to be a court hearing, often multiple 
court hearings. Uh, and then in each of those court hearings, somebody has to argue, usually for both sides, if the person shows up. The judge has to make decisions. The case has to go forward in stages. Uh, and then if it goes really far, there can actually be uh, a case where people would call witnesses and have a jury trial and sort of go through the, the process that you will see on television for a court case where you've got uh, you know, lawyers arguing back and forth in front of it, a room with a crowd and a bunch of people. Uh, this is a, that kind of process can take a long time. Uh, courts are pretty crowded these days. There's just lots of different things going on and lots of different businesses or different lawsuits. And so it often takes a few months in between each one of those stages uh, so that an average case can take a year or maybe a little longer than that, depending. And so if you get all the way, this is what it might look like. <laughs> <laughs> so, there are some limitations uh, in these kind of trials. Um, one relates to the rights of the accused, which is what I'm talking about when I use the term confrontation. Uh, in most countries, based on either the like continental European or uh, British uh, American legal systems, uh, there is a right of the person accused of doing something wrong of confronting the person accusing them. Uh, in a lot of criminal cases, this makes a, this makes perfect sense, uh, right? If like the police arrest you for you know robbing a bank or something, you get a chance to see the people that arrest you and make an argument to them so that they can't just make up a crime and throw you in jail. Uh, in the case of online harassment, though, this can be something of a problem because a person who is engaging in online harassment over time uh, can make it a very hostile environment for a person. And having to actually go to court and sit in the same room and even be questioned by the person who has been harassing you or their lawyer who's going to take an aggressive stance can be a pretty rough experience. Uh, and so that is something that people need to think about if we want to use a legal process to try and solve the problem. You have to be willing to go through that in order to protect the accused who does have a number of rights under most legal systems. Um, I mentioned a little bit about multiple stages, but again, that is something that draws out the process and makes it difficult. Um, and the last thing that is a major difficulty in these cases is evidence. Um, in order to prove something before a court, there's a pretty high evidentiary standard. Um, if you think about it from the court's perspective, this is because somebody's coming to them who wants the court, the entire force of law of the state, to do something. and that court has never heard of the, the entire matter before. So they don't want to be bringing the entire force of the government and the state uh, to bear without knowing that they're really doing something that is correct. And therefore, they have high evidentiary standards. This means, for example, that uh, if one just took a screenshot of something that was later deleted, that might not be enough to prove something in the court because screenshots can be altered or uh, faked. We actually are in an interestingly good situation on this because Wikipedia is really good for a court evidentiary perspective. Uh, the way the software works as far as recording every uh, edit ever made to any page is uh, what, what one might call self-authenticating in legal terms, basically meaning that like the way the, the actual like, software works provides proof that would probably satisfy a court of uh, what happened at a particular time. However, if there is off-wiki evidence or people's private emails, text messages, any other thing like that, um, something like preserving a site on internet archive or contacting someone early and saving the originals of everything you get can be necessary to be able to bring a court case to solve a problem. So that's a lot of the negatives. Let me talk about what this can do um, and why this sort of thing works. So a court decision that isn't obeyed it can mean that a person will have to pay money or face a country's police force if they don't follow the rules. Um, so for example, let's say that someone is consistently uh, harassing a, an editor on Wiki and even manages to find some of their personal information and starts sending them uh, consistent threatening emails, publishes, publishes their address, you know, a very serious case that is the type that the legal process would think about. 
Uh, maybe, maybe the person even makes threats against uh, physically or something like that. Uh, in a case like that, you could get a court to actually tell this person, to find the real person somewhere in the world, and tell them, do not communicate anymore with this editor. Uh, and if they've been saying lies, you know, if they're not just making threats, but they're actually publishing lies, saying that you, I don't know, they robbed a bank, to follow with that example, and did all these terrible things that people might believe, um, you can get them to take those lies down, or correct them, uh, and maybe even have them pay out some amount of money. Uh, this is sort of the flip side of when people are complaining about Wikipedia articles, and it's not common that we are on this side of the case, but some of these laws about things like defamation were actually created with these sort of circumstances in mind, where someone is really trying to harass a person, telling lies, and affecting their reputation. Um, and so those kinds of court decisions can be effective for making somebody stop doing something really bad if you get through the whole process. So that's sort of the end of this. Um, you know, it is not a, in some ways it's not a terribly complex process. Some, someone does something that is really seriously bad that the courts would really think about correcting. Uh, and if you kind of keep all the evidence, uh, save everything, and bring it all together, then that is a case that the courts can potentially fix the problem for. But, Doing this kind of thing, going through a court case to help uh, protect an editor, is something that can take uh, a lot of time, a lot of work, and can be a pretty difficult process to go through. So it is something that is best reserved for very serious cases, uh, and especially cases where you try other things, things like community processes, um, things like negotiation or informal mediation, things like ARBCOM blocks, um, and none of those things are working. Because then, and sort of a final point on that, is when a lot of other things have been tried, those attempts to fix the problem themselves can become evidence in a court case that can then show that there really is a serious problem and that the courts need to intervene and help. So this is a relatively short uh, presentation part of this, but uh, I wanted to leave a fair amount of time for people to ask questions about maybe different types of situations, as well as maybe for Patrick to comment um, a little bit on uh, some of the situations you may have seen or questions that you might expect people to have about this. Let's start with Sydney. I'll just add one quick comment. Um, is to negatives, but if, even under the serious situations, the person often gets a relatively short sentence if they you know, if they are convicted of something. So you put a lot of effort and time into something, and you know within a year or two years they're going to be back and have the ability to do it again. So that is cons you know a consideration for you know going forward and doing something um, that you may not actually feel satisfied even if you get maximum. Okay. Oh, you have to be, understand what the maximum will likely be, so you won't have unrealistic expectations. It's probably the best way of saying it. Yeah, I would sort of explain that in that process that the law often thinks of first-time offenders as really not being bad people, and so that long process can even be not just going through one court case, but actually, as he was saying, you go through something, they get a very short penalty for like a few months where they're not supposed to do something, uh, or they go to jail for a short time and then get out and start causing problems again, uh, and then you have to go through a second or even a third uh, proceeding before somebody that is in the judicial system looks at that and says, yeah, that is a, that is a real problem and we need to actually like solve this problem in a more permanent way. There's a question in the back, and then... Uh, Um, thanks a lot for the comment, for the presentation. First of all, I have a question concerning the scope of the services that um, you provide. Uh, if you could give about like one or two real life examples of situations which were within the purview of the legal defense system, perhaps give one example which was outside of that. Um, especially concerning that at the outset of the presentation, uh, it was uh, mentioned that you do help with situations on and off wiki. So that's what I would like to 
know where the line is, where you draw the line between the the involvement of the instigator inside and outside of Wiki. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so let me give a couple examples of situations where this kind of legal thing would make sense. Um, an on Wiki situation is uh, if a person is going on to Wiki uh, and posting like pretty severe threats. Maybe they, they claim to have your address and they actually say they're going to come to your house and, and beat you up or something like that. And they get blocked from, from Wikipedia, but then they make sock puppets and they keep coming back on uh, and doing that. And there's, you know, there's the way that they're talking and what they're saying makes it seem like that isn't just somebody that is like really angry and saying crazy things, but is like really legitimate and uh, might carry that out. Uh, that would be something that one could then bring that to court and like stop them from doing it. Um, an example of something off wiki might be. Um, Let's, okay, so here's an example that is slightly modified from something that has really happened in the past. Um, someone finds out uh, the because of what an editor has written on, someone really doesn't like them. And they find out that editor's uh, work email and the email of that person's boss, and they claim that that editor uh, has actually been uh, collecting child pornography. And the person hasn't. There's, there's no evidence showing that that person has done anything illegal, but they claim that that person is nevertheless collecting child pornography, and start emailing that person's boss. <coughs> uh, that is off wiki, but it is related to and instigated by the fact that somebody's been writing on a controversial topic on wiki, and a legal action could stop someone from doing that or communicating with that person or their organization at all. Um, a case that would probably not qualify is somebody that is just saying insulting things on wiki. So there's, there's no threats and there's no sort of like harm outside of Wiki at all. They're just making, you know, every edit that you make, they're, um, you know, disagreeing with you and saying that you're not very intelligent and that sort of thing. Uh, even if that is done over a long time, it's creating a harassing environment. There just isn't anything in the law right now that would address that kind of thing. And so it probably would be a case that, that couldn't be fixed by the law. Um, unfortunately, because I think that is also really terrible. I was just wondering if you've also considered as an, as an intermediate step, sometimes these harassers, uh, people doing this, are doing this from uh, computers that are under the control of an institution like a university or a corporation. Back in my earlier days as an administrator, when I was more active with the block button than I was I am now, I did face harassment from some people. In one of those cases where somebody was vandalizing my user page on multiple wikis, I uh, was able to track that. This was someone I was unblock. I had denied twice and was not going to unblock under any circumstances at that point. He, uh, you know, what I found out was he was using IPs, and I traced him to one particular university and got in touch with the uh, people who ran the computers there. And since you know, people, you usually have terms of use under which you can't use the university or the corporation's computers to harass or defame or all sorts of uh, string of bad verbs to people. And I think, I never heard back, but I know after I had exchanged a few emails with the assistants, I never got a primary or a problem with this guy again. And, you know, in, in the case of a couple of school vandals, I found out that their computer access had been revoked as a, or suspended as a consequence of vandalizing Wikipedia. So this does work because the institutions can do a lot more to these users than, you know, from within than we can do outside. And then to Patrick, I think, to talk about some of the like support uh, and some of the trust and safety work that your team does. Yeah, and so we, we definitely try and look at some of those avenues. Um, there's definitely uh, you know government-owned networks as well that have pretty strong um, guidelines on how they're meant to be used and not not meant to be used. Um, of course, you know sometimes that can lead to an escalation where um, we have some success with that. Uh, someone is now more angry and now finds coffee shops and there's more devices we can do that. But it is, it can be uh, effective sometimes. Uh, another thing that we try and pursue on occasion when we, we think it can be effective is talking to ISPs, to service providers. Um, but there's a huge variation on how service providers react to these sort of um, uh, requests. Um, sometimes um, you'll just get a form letter back saying they simply do not do this sort of thing unless there's a criminal charge or a, a 
you know, a, a criminal subpoena for information. Um, but sometimes you'll get a person at the company, and they'll be concerned about it, and they'll they'll work with you. So, yeah, it's unfortunately there's no uniform or no reliable approach to those ones, but they can they can work sometimes. And so, yeah, we definitely try and pursue them when possible. But um, there is a sort of a flip side to that too, where you know, us contacting, say, someone's employer, um, you know, can have a lot of ne negative repercussions for them. So we have to sort of look at our moral um, obligations in that respect as well. Um, but of course, if it's something that is serious, death threats or such, we have to sort of consider the moral, <laughs> their moral rights a little bit waived in that situation if, if they've gone to that level. Um, but yeah, there is definitely some medium intermediate steps that can can be found. And then the one in the back. Hi, are there any jurisdictional limits? And also, do you interfere in cases that would uh, involve a person going against their own government or um, anything like that? Thank you. Okay, so first part of that question is jurisdictional limits. Um, I mentioned briefly that an example of where legal process can work is when uh, someone is in the same country as the person harassing them, uh, and that is that helps a lot. Um, it can be a problem if, let's say, the person harassing you online is in a small country in Southeast Asia or Eastern Europe, um, because many of the countries in those regions do not have a good legal process, and so even if you took a case to court uh, in the United States or the UK, let's say, and, and won it, you wouldn't be able to actually get to the person in the place where they are and stop them from doing what they're doing. And so that would be, the law is just not effective in that sort of case. Uh, and that is a symptom of the fact that we live in a world that has lots of different countries, each of which has to offer in borders. Uh, and it is unfortunate that we can't do that. Uh, the second part of the question was uh, regarding like, people that are going against their government uh, or something.